All right, folks. Uh, so uh, you're all uh, settling in for an awesome lecture by uh, our own homegrown Jonathan Eisen, uh, who's uh, this is my favorite lecture I think every year because he gives us an update on uh, what's happened in the last 12 months with advances of uh, NGS. <laughs> Uh, desperately trying to keep up. There's no. Um, all right, so uh, what I'm tasked with here is to not actually talk about what I study, um, which is evolution and related things, but to talk about the evolution of DNA sequencing. Um, but I thought I would give you a little bit of uh, perspective just quickly on what I'm interested in. So I'm a bit obsessed with open access and open science. I'm not going to talk about that, um, but if you want to talk, I'm going to come tomorrow. Um, I'm here with my kids, but I'm going to come tomorrow in the morning and try and hang out. So if people have questions after my talk, or if you want to talk about open science or um, social media and science, which I'm also not going to talk about. I'm sure most people here don't care about my other obsession with the Red Sox, but um, sorry. <laughs> um, I am, actually, I work on this last thing, which is microbial evolution. I'm not going to give a couple of examples from that. Oh, by the way, this is uh, in ninth grade, you could write your own essay question for English class. And that's the question, that's my handwriting, by the way. Um, that's the question I invented. Describe one step in the evolution of a bacterium. I don't, I don't remember being a dork, but you know, yeah. What grade did you get on the essay? I don't remember, A minus, I think, you know, then, you know grade inflation, it, I'm sure it sucked. But, um, I posted the whole essay on my blog, so I, I, I don't remember if it was good or bad. Um, what I work on in my lab is basically applying phylogenetic methods, phylogenetic approaches to the study of microbial diversity, and in particular with DNA sequencing data. And I've been doing this um, for about 20 years now, and my lab does a lot of DNA sequencing. We occasionally work on the methods, which I will be talking about for developing DNA sequencing, but we work much more on the informatics for analyzing the data and then applying those methods to the study of individual microbes or populations of microorganisms. So, for example, um, based in part on things that you know I and other people in my lab have learned from many of the people who are teaching in this class, we've developed a high-throughput Bayesian phylogenetics approach for analyzing random shotgun sequence data from microbial communities. That's called PhyloSift. We also um, basically apply a phylogenetic approach to selecting organisms for sequencing, so going out to the diversity of microbes that are out there and saying where are the gaps in the genome data that's out there. Um, the latest that we're doing, which I will mention very briefly later on, is to, if you take a phylogenetic approach to bacteria and archaea and actually microbial eukaryotes, and you ask where are the genome sequences uh, available, most of the branches are not represented in genome data. Um, but most of the branches have never been cultured in the laboratory. And so uh, in the past, we could only sequence genomes by culturing the organisms, but now there are multiple approaches for sequencing genomes from uncultured lineages. And we, um, the Joint Genome Institute launched this, what they call the Dark Matter of Biology Project, um, to sequence phylogenetically novel um, lineages from single cells and then sequence the whole genome of those single cells and generate genome data from uh, evolutionarily novel lineages, and we have a new uh, NSF grant that's uh, to do this also. Um, but I'm not going to talk about those in detail, but again, if you have questions, um, I'm happy to talk about those. And anywhere along the way here, please stop me and just if something doesn't make sense. But what I want to do is give you sort of a perspective on um, the evolution of DNA sequencing. And just as I'm sort of obsessed with applying phylogenetic and historical methods to the study of microbes. I think it's important to understand the history behind some of these DNA sequencing methods, even if we're not using most of them anymore, um, because a lot of the data that's out there has come from different methods along the way, and it's useful when you're trying to analyze a new data set to understand um, that some of the data comes from generation one, some of it comes from generation two, some of it comes from generation three, and understanding the, the bells and whistles associated with those approaches can be really important when you're trying to interpret uh, data sets that are a mixture from across those methods. So I'm going to post all the slides on the, the wiki, um, uh, and I've put a few links in here. I based a lot of the material for the first part of this talk on two really great review papers on 
um, sort of the history of DNA sequencing by Elaine Mardis, and I put the links up here too. There are also a couple of really nice open access review papers from a couple of years ago on DNA sequencing. And along the way, on all the slides, I've tried to include references for where I got any of the figures, any of the information. There uh, should be a hot link in the slides and also at least a DOI or something where you can find any of the papers that any of this came from. So um, you may or may not know, uh, but you know, the history of DNA sequencing was pretty static for a long period of time. And I'm going to go into some of this, you know, the, the old school methods very briefly at the beginning, but you know, there was this development of DNA sequencing methods and not, not a lot changed conceptually for about 20 years until the so-called next generation sequencing methods came along about 10 years ago now. Um, and now things just are completely insane, and this is what Brian was sort of <laughs> hinting at before. I, I can't keep up. Um, there's new DNA sequencing approaches that come out basically every two months or something, and new developments within, e within each of the methods that come out uh, quite a bit. But I'll try and cover sort of the big picture of how some of these methods work, and then some of the sort of bells and whistles that might be useful in particular to um, population biologists and evolutionary biologists and ecologists, which I, um, is sort of where you're going to get a lot of sequence um, data. So uh, I've never done this before, but I'm going to try. I actually now I'm trying to re reconstruct the actual evolution of DNA sequencing here. There's, this is a methods-free approach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, no data behind, well, there is some data behind it, but it's a simple, single theory that is being presented. So in the beginning, there was DNA, um, and people wanted to read those darn string of letters in this DNA, and they would you know, bang it on the ground and uh, do all sorts of chemical reactions, and they could tell properties of the DNA, but not the string of letters in the DNA. And then in the you know, 1960s a little bit, early 1970s, a bunch of people started to hack together methods that were basically chemical reactions that you would throw at DNA, pieces of DNA, especially really enriched for particular subsets of pieces of DNA from a particular organism, and then try and sort of fragment the DNA in a lot of different ways, and then read a couple of, you know, four base pair strings of letters within those fragments and reconstruct the sequence. And I'm going to call that generation zero, um, proto-sequencing, uh, you know, some sort of primitive, not quite living system here um, for DNA sequencing. And there are lots and lots of examples of this uh, in the literature where people took an approach to trying to read the DNA sequence of like the LAC repressor or the lambda repressor or a couple of bases from this organism, a couple of bases from that organism. Um, and these approaches, you know, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. And just uh, to show you some examples of this, oh, by the way, earlier today, I posted, or maybe yesterday, I don't even remember anymore, I posted to Twitter, hey, I'm working on my talk again, does anybody have any ideas? And I posted a link to my slides. And I've also included who pointed out, you know, other things I could add in here along the way. So David States was like, hey, you didn't mention any of the chemical proto-sequencing, so... Um, and, you know, Wally Gilbert and Alan Maxim, who will come back again to us in a minute, um, developed one of these methods, and then there's a whole slew of these other papers, and they're basically, you know, look, they're reading um, uh, PCP, PTP, you know, just really short pieces of DNA from isolated DNA fragments. How long after protein sequencing? When did protein sequencing start? I mean, I think protein sequencing um, began, you know, in the 50s probably, but really took off, uh, you know, a little bit later in the 60s. And that's when, um, you know, the original Molecular Evolution papers came out by Zucker, Candle, and Pauling and a few other people. The first one of those was like 1962 and then 1965. So protein sequencing took off before DNA or RNA sequencing. There's a whole history behind that um, protein sequencing too. But the DNA sequencing really did not develop well until after a lot of the protein sequencing had developed. And that's why for the first, you know, 15, 20 years of molecular phylogenetics, molecular evolution, it was dominated by protein sequence analysis because people couldn't read the DNA sequence data very well. And it was a little trickier, I think. And, and at some point, I would say probably in the early 1970s, DNA sequencing became easier than the protein sequencing, or maybe mid-1970s. And when we got to generation one, which I'll get to in a minute, that's when really DNA sequencing took off and people started to replace 
protein sequencing with just sequencing the genes behind the proteins and then predicting the protein sequence from the gene sequence. Um, but I don't, I don't know the whole, I'll have to add the, you know, separate history of protein. Okay, um, and so um, these sort of developed for a little while. Many of them, you know, were kind of lame, went extinct. Um, but a few of them stuck around and the methods that were used and learned helped lead to the revolution which I'm going to call generation one, which is what I'm, what I'm going to call manual sequencing. Of course, previously it was just called sequencing. Um, but uh, as you'll see, when manual sequencing gets replaced by automated sequencing, we renamed uh, this era manual sequencing. And so there were basically two major methods that were developed for manual sequencing. I mean, there were many, but there were two major methods that were developed for this second era. One by Fred Sanger and colleagues that became known as Sanger sequencing and one by Maxim and Gilbert, the people on that previous paper that I was showing you that became known as Maxim Gilbert sequencing. And these both were used a reasonable amount for uh, some period of time in the 1970s uh, and then early 1980s. Maxim Gilbert sequencing was a um, complicated, toxic uh, chemical reaction basically that you would take um, your DNA, uh, isolated DNA, in one tube, you would react the DNA with a certain set of chemicals that would cleave the DNA at certain bases in the DNA. Like here, it's cleaving at you know, A and G, or um, a combination of chemicals that would cleave at particular sites. Here, it's cleaving at C and T. Here, it's cleaving at C. And by doing these mixtures and then running the DNA out on a gel, you can infer the sequence by the combination of all of the chemical reactions that you did on these DNAs. Um, and uh, I mean, I assume many people don't you know, even run these types of sequencing gels anymore, but you're basically separating the DNA out by single base pair differences in size, and then you can read the DNA sequence by going up in a ladder along these individual single base pair differences in the gels. Um, uh, Sanger um, developed an alternative method, which turns out to be um, preferred by many people in the laboratory for a lot of reasons. Um, and what his method was, was using these chain termination um, chemicals where you would take a tube, add, uh, take, take your piece of DNA in the tube, and then you would basically run um, a DNA sequencing reaction and with a little bit of dideoxy A in the tube. And, uh, but the predominant fraction of the A in the tube did not have this weird chemical form. And if that dideoxy A got incorporated where it was trying to incorporate an A into the growing chain, that stopped the reaction. It couldn't extend past that spot. So it was called chain terminating uh, reaction. And so um, in a tube, you would have, um, a, you know, for A, you would get a strong band in the DNA when you ran it out on a gel wherever there was an A in that supposed to be incorporated because some fraction of the DNA chain elongation would stop when it put in one of these dideoxy A's. And the same thing would happen with dideoxy G, dideoxy T, dideoxy C. And so you could literally just walk your way up the, the ladder here and read the DNA sequence by where you got a band in each of these different tubes. So C, 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 T, C, C, A, A, T, et cetera. Um, it was a lot easier to use than um, Maxim Gilbert sequencing, basically, and it was a little um, less toxic. So off, off the record, I guess, um, I learned Sanger sequencing in Wally Gilbert's lab um, from people in his lab who refused to do Maxim Gilbert sequencing, even though they were in the lab where it was invented. Um, and Sanger sequencing took off and became the DNA sequencing method for many, many years. I have a bunch of slides in here that I'll probably skip over, but if you're interested, you can look to learn more of the details on how each of these um, methods work. Uh, they shared the Nobel Prize along with Paul Berg for this in 1980, um, but really the Sanger sequencing method became the method used for DNA sequencing for the next uh, 15 or so years at least. Um, and each of these methods had some uh, developments that happened, you know, which uh, chemical reaction you used for the Maxim Gilbert sequencing, which exactly how you did the reactions for Sanger sequencing and how you poured the gel and what polymerase you used and the 
everything. So there was sort of an evolution within this, and some of them didn't work very well, and some of them did. Um, but eventually, the critical development that happened for genomics, for the DNA sequencing world, was that some people took a look at the manual Sanger sequencing, this, I'm just going to go back here for a second, this, you know, um, mixing in dideoxy A into this tube and then running, built, pouring an acrylamide gel and then running dideoxy A reaction for sequence number one in this lane, dideoxy T for sequence number one in this lane, and then you could pour a gel with, you know, 48 lanes and run 12 samples times four um, nucleotides for those samples in each of these gels, and you could eventually do a lot of these. So I um, uh, worked at this place called Tiger for eight years, the Institute for Genomic Research, and I moved there in 1998. And they had literally an army of people that were there to pour acrylamide gels and to load acrylamide gels, run them, and then pull off the plates from these gels and try and do really high throughput um, manual Sanger sequencing. But just at that time, basically, the people were getting rid of the gels and moving to high throughput automated DNA sequencing, which revolutionized um, genomics. And so um, this had many, many developments. I'm going to show you a couple of them. But it basically dominated the sequencing world for many, many years with multiple companies developing approaches to this high throughput automated sequencing. There are two different types of automation that I'm going to show you that became really important for this world of DNA sequencing. The first type of automation was the use of fluorescent um, chain termination analogs so that when you had an A incorporated, it would label the the band blue, and when you had a T incorporated, it would label the band red, and when you had a C incorporated, it would label the band yellow, and so on. So you had four different colors now, and you could now run um, your four different reactions in a single tube, in a single capillary filled with acrylamide. And so um, companies started to develop automated methods to do this. Um, Applied Biosystems built a couple of these, and I'll show you a couple more of these in a minute. Um, and so basically you could um, have a, a clump like neurons of tubes filled with acrylamide and then load at the top of these tubes um, your DNA reaction. So in tube number one would go DNA sequencing reaction number one with the four different nucleotides mixed together. Tube number two would go DNA sequence number two. You'd run electrophoresis in these capillaries. It would separate the DNA based on its size. And then you'd have a a laser that was fluorescently activating and reading the colors as they came through, you know, uh, two feet down in the capillaries once the DNA had been separated by its single base pair sizes. And now, by not having to manually go in and look at the gels and not have to manually pour these acrylamide gels on glass plates, and by having everything sort of starting to be integrated with computers, the throughput for DNA sequencing you know, went up a hundredfold in a year, basically. Um, and as people realized that you could get one of these automated sequencing machines, many places bought a lot of them. And that's when the large sort of genome centers became created and when um, the Human Genome Project took off and when many other sort of initial genome sequencing projects took off was due to this automation of Sanger sequencing. So there were incredible diversity of um, systems that were designed to do this, each one, you know, supposedly better, faster, cheaper, nicer um, than the last. There were, I think, at least five different companies that manufactured these types of systems. Um, the ABI systems tended to dominate, but there were many places that used some of these other alternative systems for doing this sequencing. So this revolutionized um, DNA sequencing by just making it more automated. And once people got a lot of these machines, they realized that there was a big limiting step, which I haven't told you about yet. So to do the Sanger sequencing, you needed um, a decent amount of DNA from your target organism. And you could generate that DNA by PCR if you knew which region of the genome you were interested in getting copies of and then sequence the PCR products. But what most people wanted to do with these automated sequencing methods was to sequence 
random pieces of DNA from the genomes or the transcriptomes of different organisms. And so you didn't know what the target was. And so the way that you got the DNA that you would then use for the sequencing reaction was to use cloning. So you would take the DNA from a target organism. If you were interested in the genomic DNA, you would shred it into pieces, and then you would clone it into a plasmid, for example, and grow that plasmid up into e an E. coli, and then extract the plasmid back out of E. coli and use that purified plasmid for your sequencing reaction. And so to do this in a high throughput manner, for example, to sequence a bacterial genome, you'd need a million of these. So um, creating a million plasmids is a pretty serious operation if you're pouring plates by hand and picking uh, colonies that grow up on those plates with toothpicks by hand. That's what Tiger did when I first was working there. So they had what we called massively parallel undergraduates um, doing colony picking of toothpicks and going through literally millions of toothpicks um, to pick these colonies. So what you do is you take the DNA from your target organism, shred it up, create a library where you would grow it in E. coli, you'd mix that with a population of E. coli, um, transform that E. coli, and then you'd plate those E. coli out on a plate, and now you have to pick separate colonies that each represent a different target DNA sequence from the original organism. This is pretty tedious, right? Um, not the, people had ergonomic problems, people were getting carpal tunnel problems. I mean, it was serious trauma going on picking millions of these colonies. So one of the most important developments with high throughput sequencing after the automation of Sanger sequencing was the automation of colony picking. And so having a robot that could take a picture of a plate, identify where the colonies were on that plate, and then with sterile tips, like pipette tips or sterile little metal devices that it could heat up and sterilize after picking them, um, could pick individual colonies, transfer them into media to grow up the E. coli from those, and then you could grow up hundreds of thousands to a million colonies of E. coli to keep up with the sequencing reactions. For, for a period of time, the, the sequencing machines weren't all even being used at many places because we just couldn't keep up with them. And the colony picking became the rate limiting step. So this, you know, brought in robotics. And that's how, for example, the Human Genome Project uh, at Solera, which was this private company sequencing the human genome, and then the public human genome projects really took off by integrating colony picking robotics with automated DNA sequencing, with somewhat automated informatics analyzing the data. And all those three things put together, by the end of the era of high throughput Sanger sequencing, it ended up costing about 25 cents at a high throughput genome sequencing center to sequence a single 1,000 base pair piece of DNA using Sanger sequencing. And we thought that was amazing. I mean, when um, high throughput DNA sequencing started with first the automated sequencing and then with the automated robotics, you know, initially when I got to Tiger, it was about $10 per sequencing an individual piece of DNA. So in eight years, it went from $10 to 25 cents. And so we would get grants, you know, one year we would get a grant to sequence the genome of organism X. By the end of that year, the cost would be fourfold less to do the sequencing and we would have all this leftover money to do something else with that money. And so usually the funding agencies would say, can you sequence four other organisms to make up for the reduction in cost, which is usually what ended up happening. But it just, it, it was incredible how fast this developed. And then it basically hit a wall for a, a couple of years. And there weren't a lot of reductions in cost, yeah. Um. I mean, I think that people had um, robotics for doing manipulations like this in many biomedical applications. So for example, um, certain types of experiments with yeast, people wanted to do in a high throughput manner and do knockouts of every gene in the genome and, you know, but um, there really weren't good systems to do this and nothing off the shelf that really did this routinely. 
uh, what, what happened to Tiger was actually collaborations with robotics companies in order to get this to work really well for colony picking for sequencing. So, you know, each method requires some slight adaptation. So you might have a, a robot that could know where it was, you know, in three-dimensional space and could go out like DNA microarrayers, right? I mean, they were doing very similar things, but it didn't have the sterilization component to pick um, colonies and make sure they were sterile. And it didn't have the size for, so we ended up pouring plates that were like two feet by two feet to get as many colonies on them as possible. And no, none of the, all the robotics was designed for microtiter dishes. So they had, they had to be adapted basically, but there were robots that people were using for analogous applications, just not at this level. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so again, automated Sanger sequencing with the automated robotics um, was used for a very long time, basically. Um, some aspect of automated sequencing was used in the first EST sequencing um, by Venter in the first genome sequence of any free living organism and then the first eukaryotic genomes and the first animal genomes and the first plant genomes and eventually started to get used for all sorts of other um, applications. And around 2004 was when we sort of consider that was the, when it was working the best. It was, again, about 25 cents for a single Sanger sequencing reaction. And so automated Sanger sequencing basically launched genomics. But if you, you know, if you're familiar with what it costs now to do DNA sequencing, um, 25 cents for 1,000 base pairs is just disgustingly expensive. Um, and, but at the time, it, it seemed absurdly cheap compared to what things had been a couple of years before. And what's changed is um, what's now called next generation sequencing. The big change that happened with next generation sequencing that led to um, the current state we're in, basically, is a replacement of clones with clusters. So this cumbersome step where you take DNA or RNA from your organism, you clone it into either E. coli or some other vector for growing copies of that DNA. You then have to plate it out. You then have to extract the DNA back out of that organism and run your sequencing reaction. That is cumbersome in terms of time. It's cumbersome in terms of space. It's cumbersome in terms of expense. And what was invented was alternative methods that allowed you to do making lots of extra copies of target pieces of DNA all in vitro without ever having to do this cloning. And that's what we call clusters. They're not all exactly the same thing, but these next generation sequencing methods were all cluster-based approaches. Um, and so the first one of these that um, became commercialized was the 454 sequencing, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. There were lots of variants that developed for 454 sequencing. Selexa sequencing, Selexa was bought by Illumina, 454 was bought by Roche, so then it became known as Roche sequencing. Illumina bought Selexa, so now it's known as Illumina sequencing, and there were lots of derivatives developed for Illumina sequencing. ABI um, developed their own method um, called ABI solid, and so there were lots of these clone uh, replacement methods with clusters, and I'll tell you about each of them in a minute. And then um, on top of all of these, um, the guy who started 454 uh, left to start this company, Ion Torrent, and he basically took the concept behind 454 sequencing for a component of it, still using clusters, and replaced the method that was being used for sequencing for that approach to use, as we'll see in a, in a couple minutes, uh, uh, detection of pH changes rather than a detection of fluorescence for sequencing. But these are all cluster-based methods rather than clone-based methods. And I'm going to just quickly go through these different methods to give you an idea as to what they're doing, although right now Illumina is sort of the dominant of these. Any day a different, you know, cluster-based method could replace Illumina probably. Um, although, you know, Illumina is absolutely dominating the market right now. Um, and this is what's, be for whatever reason, became known as next-gen sequencing, even though there were at least three generations before it. I don't know exactly who picked next-gen sequencing. So basically, uh, Illumina over here on the left, 454 in the middle, solid on the right, 
They all work in the same general way. You take your organism, you isolate the DNA, you do some type of cleanup of that DNA, and then um, you create a library. The library construction methods are all different for each of these approaches, but in general, you do some modification of the ends of the DNA pieces to set it up for the sequencing that's going to happen later. Um, in um, the Roche sequencing and also in the iron torrent sequencing, the cluster-based method, as I'll show you a couple of pictures of in a minute, is something called emulsion PCR. You basically take your DNA and you encapsulate individual DNA pieces in a little emulsion bead. And then you run a PCR reaction inside that bead. And it traps the DNA in this bead so that you can make millions and millions of copies of that target piece of DNA inside bead number one. And you have a little test tube with 500,000 beads and you make copies of each of the individual beads DNA inside that test tube. So no cloning anymore. Everything is happening in each of these emulsion beads. And as you'll see in a minute, Illumina uses this solid uh, clustering on a slide to do the same, in principle, the same reaction, same concept. Um, I already mentioned this. It started out as 454, and then Roche bought it and called it Roche 454 for a little while, and then they ditched the 454 name and called it Roche, and now it's sort of off the market right now, although there are rumors that they keep saying they're going to keep it on the market because um, it does have some distinct features compared to Illumina sequencing. Um, the way it does the sequencing is using a method called Pyra sequencing. I don't think the details really matter um, that much for exactly how it does the sequencing, but it has one particular feature or um, problem with doing the DNA sequencing. When um, it runs the sequencing reaction, it's basically reading light that comes off um, due to a chemical reaction. And um, if there are two of the same bases in a row in your target DNA sequence, like AA, or three bases, AAA in a row, the way it recognizes that there are two of those is by having double the signal. It doesn't have a temporal ability to recognize that there's an A at this moment and then an A at another moment. And it doesn't separate the DNA out by size like in the old Sanger sequencing. It's just detecting the amount of fluorescence. And again, if there's a run of these nucleotides, it's just trying to quantify how much of this light is coming off. And that's not very accurate. So it does a pretty poor job of reading, of num identifying the number of bases in a run of the same base. And that's been one of the major limitations of 454 sequencing for certain genomics applications. Um, I'll just really quickly uh, go through and outline the, the protocol. You basically take um, the DNA at interest. You do this library construction that's targeted towards how the sequencing is going to work. Um, and then you um, encapsulate these DNA pieces inside these beads. And then you run a PCR reaction, basically, to make copies of each of those um, inside the beads. They call them micro-reactors. You have um, this amplification, and then what you're going to try and do is read the DNA sequence um, off of one of these microreactors that now has, in theory, millions of copies of that original target piece of DNA um, attached to it. And you're going to read that by um, basically having a slide that has little cavities in it. You m mix onto the slide. Um, these emulsion reactions, and you hope that only one of them goes into each hole, so you don't have two different DNA pieces mixed together into a single hole, and you hope that most of the holes are filled so you're not wasting money s running sequencing reactions on blank spots, basically. And then the different 454 sequencing machines, for example, had different sizes, so they had a mini machine that could read about 100,000 of these and a large machine that could read about a million of these. Um, at a time. And uh, again, you know, uh, compared to Illumina sequencing, running a million at a time may not seem like much, but for $10,000 you could get a million sequence reactions of about 200 base pairs in length. Um, that was starting to push the envelope compared to the best possible Sanger sequencing at the best highest throughput center that ever existed. So um, it really started to become
uh, the way to do cheap DNA sequencing was 454 sequencing for the time when it was out there before Illumina became publicly available. This is a micrograph of what these little reaction wells look like. Um, the, the details don't matter that much other than I think that this run of nucleotides um, can't get read perfectly. You can't identify how many nucleotides are in one of these runs very well. Um, again, they started out with this 100 base pair reads, um, approximately 20 million base pairs per run. I mean, at the time, this was amazing because to do this in Sanger sequencing, you would have to have you know, a, a gigantic room for the colony picking and a gigantic room for the capillary electrophoresis and millions of dollars invested in all of these things. And f with the purchase of a single Roche machine for something like $500,000, you could replace basically a warehouse of Sanger sequencing operation with one single machine. Um, and they you know, kept upgrading the length of the reads or the number of wells that you could read at a single time and tried to reduce the amount of time that it would take to do one of these runs. Does that basically make sense what 454 sequencing, the big picture of what it's doing? Because um, Illumina is basically the same thing but the exact details of each of the steps are very different. But the concept is the same. Trying to find a way to make lots of copies of the target DNA in a physically isolated environment, not taking up a lot of space, all in some you know, in vitro reaction. And the way it does it is incredibly creative. Uh, when I first heard about it, I just I didn't believe it worked. Um, and uh, it took them a little while to commercialize it, but now Illumina is really basically taken over the sequencing market. Um, and so again, the, the concept is very similar. You take your sample, you chop up the DNA into a variety of ways, you modify the ends of the pieces of DNA depending on exactly what, how you're gonna run the sequencing. You do generate these clusters, which I'll show you how it works in a minute, but you generate physical clusters of DNA, making lots of copies of each individual DNA piece. And then you run something called sequencing by synthesis. It's a different chemical reaction sequencing than the pyro sequencing, but it's still a sequencing reaction. Yeah. No, I'm going to show you. Uh, if you wait one second, I have slides showing how it works. Um, and um, and then you basically. Uh, you have the clusters on a slide and you run the sequencing by synthesis on this slide and you read fluorescence um, of each of these physical spots on the slide that correspond to different uh, pieces of your original DNA. So this is an outline of how it works. This may help uh, explain it a little more. So you take your, your targeted DNA, you add some adapters to it, the exact details of the adapters change but um, the key to the adapters is you're going to use them to run both the sequencing reaction and a PCR reaction um, on these pieces of DNA. And then you attach the DNA um, to a slide. So you have a slide and you bind, um, you, you make the DNA single stranded and then you bind the DNA to this slide and it attaches the DNA basically to, by one of these adapters till there's a piece of the DNA sort of sticking up off the slide floating around in space. And then um, what you do is you run this variant of PCR um, called bridge PCR where it basically runs a PCR amplification that works only in the physical region around where one of these DNA pieces attached to the slide. And the way this works is basically you've spotted primers all on this slide that are going to help you for this bridge PCR reaction. And, um, Using a combination of the adapters that you've put onto these pieces of DNA, you can basically run a localized PCR reaction that's only going to make copies of the piece of DNA that is attached to this little spot on the slide in the physical environment right around that piece of DNA. And they still stay stuck to the slide. So now you have one piece of DNA here and then another piece of DNA you know, a few nanometers separated from it and another piece of DNA over here and another piece over here. And then you run this bridge PCR reaction where you're gonna make a little cluster that corresponds to the original piece of DNA. You're gonna make 
millions of copies of that piece of DNA right around it, and millions of copies of this other piece of DNA right around it. So it's a pretty amazing concept to run this sort of localized PCR, but in the end you get this basically stack of copies of that original target piece of DNA physically located around it. Now you don't know where any of these pieces of DNA are on your slide yet. This is sort of a random reaction, You're just mixing the DNA onto here and putting it down in a concentration such that you hope roughly, you know, some set of DNAs gets spread out along this slide. You run this bridge PCR reaction, and then what you can do is either in an initial sort of checking step, or you can just run the whole sequencing reaction if you want to, um, when you see the fluorescence coming off as you run the sequencing reaction, you can see clusters on the slide where the color is always the same, right? So if you have a million copies of A, 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 C, 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 C here, and a million copies of T, 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 A, G, G, G here, when you run the sequencing reaction and you look at basically a time lapse of the slide, there's always going to be a correlation between what's in this physical region over time. And you can draw the boundaries of these clusters pretty easily by looking at a few rounds of this chemical reaction. And so you now identify where pieces of DNA settled down by where you get these clusters of analogous sequence coming off the machine. And so you see that showing it here, you see in one cycle of this sequencing by synthesis, that's what you get, and you can pretty much, depending on how densely you've spotted it down, you might be able to identify it in one single um, reaction. If you put them down too densely, you might have, you know, a green, a yellow, another yellow right next to this yellow, and you might not quite be able to tell that it's two uh, versus one, but I think it's pretty quick with the um, way people do Illumina sequencing now. Um, I don't think the sequencing by synthesis matters that much unless you're really interested in doing variants of how the libraries are constructed. But the bridge PCR is sort of the key to getting millions upon millions upon millions of sequences, copies of each of those sequences on a single slide. So the latest Illumina sequencing, um, you probably use multiple flow cells, mul multiple ones of these slides. Um, but on a single slide, you can probably get I forget what it is, 20 million spots, 20 million bridge PCR reactions, and now run 200 base pair sequencing or 300 base pair sequencing for 20 million spots uh, in 20 hours or something to that effect. I mean, it's just an absurd amount of data that comes off of one of these systems. Um, and, you know, th they're trying all of these um, groups try to figure out ways to get the sequencing to run as long as possible without losing quality in the sequencing reaction. Uh, depending on what machine you use and what setup you use, you can now get about 300 base pairs of sequence, 250 to 300 base pairs of sequence off of some Illumina machines. Um, I don't even have the latest here. This is from a couple of years ago. So the MySeq machines now, many people, including us, are doing 250 base pair, pair end reads. Um, in less than 27 hours, probably, although I'm not sure the exact time, and you get uh, something like 30 million of those in a single run for $1,000. Um, so again, as we move into each of these different sequencing systems, the cost per base pair is plummeting with each one of them. Um, and again, I can't even keep up. Um, there's a new Illumina system that seems to come out about every three months. Um, and, you know, you probably should just go to Illumina and try and figure out if you're interested in the latest that they're doing. You know, they announced sometime last year this high seek by 10. It's like, you know, they say it's a system. It's really 10 machines. Um, it's not, you know, anything particularly uh, novel, but it's 10 machines that are, in theory, coordinated with each other um, in some way. Uh, and if you want to, you know, eventually get to the $1,000 human genome, which I still don't think people are quite at, um, you need to basically um, spend a lot of money buying machines and not count the cost of the machines when you're calculating the cost of the $1,000 genome. Um, and eventually you can get uh, sequencing enough to get to a $1,000 genome. Um, 
Yeah, so the high seq by 10 was saying the output per run, if you do dual flow cells, was almost two terabytes of sequence data, um, six billion reads um, at 150 base pairs per read. So it's kind of ludicrous almost. Um, I don't know how many people here, you know, in their daily lives deal with Illumina sequence data um, for things that they're working on. So, you know, with the, the high seq by 10, um, nobody even has ways to transfer this data to anyone else, basically. I mean, if you're downloading, yeah, you FedEx hard drives to everybody. I mean, it's kind of uh, old school method for transferring the data behind these machines. And it's more expensive in some cases to store and transfer the data than it is to redo the run. So um, people are still trying to figure out what to do with many of these sequencing systems in terms of data rather than in terms of you know, the science. There are lots of things that you can do, but now people are sort of freaking out about um, how they're gonna keep the data. If you have a, I mean, imagine the hospital at UC Davis wants to sequence every patient, right? That's the dream is to sequence the genome of every patient coming into the hospital. Um, each patient is probably going to take, you know, a couple of terabytes of data or something to that effect. Um, they get, I don't know how many patients in a year, 200,000. Uh, I mean, it's just, there's no way that, that anybody has any idea how to store this or transfer it to the cloud to do some analysis. <laughs> take seven months to transfer it to the Amazon cloud to then run some script on the cloud. Um, so anyway, Illumina is what's dominating the market. We use Illumina machines for everything we do in my work. We do use um, PacBio also, but the Illumina systems are quite reliable. The data that's coming off of them is pretty nice and cheap and um, transforming everything we're doing in microbial studies. Uh, ABI Solid was an alternative. I'm not even going to go into the details, but if you're interested, they're going to be in the slides. Very few people are using this now, although there still are some out there. There were many other companies that developed alternatives. Um, I'm also not going to go into all the details in them. Basically, about um, five years ago now, uh, maybe more than that, six years ago now, um, people started to say, OK, which one of these machines should we pick if I'm going to buy a new machine? And people started to publish these comparisons, like this one I took from a presentation that was done in 2008, although it didn't completely convince people to to change what they were doing. But basically, um, many people at the time concluded that Illumina was the better approach. And over time, Illumina has, has won out till it's sort of massively dominating most of the market. Not all the market, but most of the market. So I mentioned before that there was this alternative that came out of 454, which is still being used by many people. And there are a couple of sort of interesting reasons why it's being used. And it's this ion torrent system same general principle, take the DNA, shred it up, add adapters, make your library, run emulsion PCR. But instead of doing the pyro sequencing, it does an alternative form of sequencing. And this sequencing is this pH-based sequencing where it's basically, instead of detecting light coming off of pieces of DNA, it detects hydrogen ions coming off and then the change in pH that happens with those hydrogen ions coming off. And they call this basically some type of you know, electric, electrochemical based sequencing, it can run very, very fast um, and reasonably cheaply, although not cheaper per base pair than Illumina sequencing, but it has some alternative advantages that many people like the systems. Uh, this is actually from a couple of years ago, but I know every once in a while there's a new genome center that opens up that says they're going to use all ion torrent systems. So there are some advantages to ion torrent. Um, compared to Illumina for certain purposes. Um, but I don't really want to go into all the detail on that. Um, what I want to do now is talk about what I think is the most important part of all of these sequencing systems. And most of what I'm going to talk about are things that have been adapted for Illumina sequencing, because that's what's dominated the market. But almost every one of these things that I'm going to talk about probably could be done for another sequencing system. So this is you know, imagining. You have a high-throughput cluster-based sequencing system. What are the things you need to do to get the right type of sequence data or get the sequence data from the right system um, for, for what you're doing? So one of the most important things that I assume anybody who's doing Illumina sequencing is familiar with, and if you're not, you will have to become familiar with it, is this multiplexing. 
So um, we never had this problem in the old days because we couldn't do enough sequencing. Um, but as the Illumina platform in particular generated so many sequence reads per run, and because of the way it works, you can't physically delineate very well where different pieces of DNA go onto this slide. So you can get lots and lots of these bridge PCR reactions, but you can't say, I want my DNA sample number one to be in the upper right quadrant, and DNA sample number two to be in the next quadrant, and DNA sample three to be in the next quadrant. That doesn't work very well. But what does work very well is to take your sample and add a short oligonucleotide tag to your sample that when you run the sequencing reaction, you can read the tag and now say, even though, um, let's say you have 10 samples and you pool them together onto a single MySeq run. And to sample number one, you can add tag A, 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 A. And to sample number two, you can add tag C, 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 and so on. So when you run the sequencing, even though you're, you mix everything together, even though all of your sample number ones may be spread out all throughout the slide, every one of them is going to have A, 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 A at the beginning of it. And now, informatically, you can demultiplex the sample and sort your sequences back into what, came, what corresponds to your original samples. And, you know, it's, there's some uh, tricks to doing this. You don't want to make um, tags that are very similar to other tags that you're using because then sequencing errors will uh, cause you to misclassify things to the wrong sample. So you want to make sure that your tags are many steps away from the other tags that you're using. There are many different sort of tricks to doing this. You don't want your tag to be too big because then you're wasting some money in running the reaction to read the tag. So there's a balance between trying to be as unique as possible versus as short as possible for doing this tagging. Right now, I've heard that people in a single um, Illumina run, there are some places that are claiming they can do about 1,000 tags at one time. Um, we do up to, I think, about 150 or so at one time. Um, and in theory, if you just make them longer and longer, you could do, them, do as many samples as you want, but then again, you're wasting money doing um, the sequencing of a tag at the same time. But because, you know, a single mice, so the simplest Illumina system, the MySeq, is generating 25 million sequences per run. In many of the studies that we do, so for example, if I go to a human skin sample and I want to look at the microbes in that human skin sample and I take a swab and I swab that sample and I want to compare all the people in this room and the microbes on their skin, many people have done sort of reconstruction experiments and said that you can distinguish many parts of the ecological sort of biosphere of a microbial community on skin with 50,000 sequences or even 10,000 sequences. So now if I'm generating 25 million sequences per run, I certainly don't need 25 million for sample number one. If I divide it into 10 samples, I'm still getting 2.5 million per sample. It's a waste. It's a complete waste of extra sequence. 250,000 is even too many. So we're, we're generating, if we use 100 tags, 250,000 sequences per tag, it's actually more than we need for most of these samples. So we would prefer if we could do 1,000 tags in many of these samples. And so there's a lot of people that are trying to figure out ways to pool together more and more um, samples into even a run of the smallest Illumina machine. And if you're using one of the bigger Illumina machines and you want to do, you know, 100 um, Arabidopsis genomes, you can probably pool together 10 of them into a single run and get a decent amount of data from each of them. So multiplexing is a key part of sequencing in almost every case for Illumina sequencing. Yeah? I was going to ask, so like for approaches like DNA metabarcoding, do you think the same logic applies as the example of skin swabbing microbes? Or well, so DNA metabarcoding, that is going to environmental samples and, and sequencing with the COX-1, with, with the barcode sequences. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's basically, so ribosome RNA sequencing is what we would be doing from skin. It's PCR amplifying ribosome RNA genes from a mixed community. Um, but the, the reconstruct, it depends on your goal of the metabarcoding. So um, I'm interested in detecting 
Yeah, so then... <laughs> um, so I want high coverage. So, so for, for the rare biosphere, uh, that's a different question. So th for many of the things that we're doing, we have the, the first pass that we're looking at is just sort of beta diversity questions. And we just want to have an idea as to how communities separate out along vectors like pH or temperature or health. And in those cases, the beta diversity clusters that come out, you don't need a lot of sequences to generate those clusters on average in most systems. And that's probably because the differences are due to changes in relative abundance of dominant taxa. And you can detect that with a small number of sequences. If you're interested in the rare organisms, um, what we do actually is either shitloads of sequencing um, or blocking. So you can block the more dominant organisms with a variety of PCR strategies, basically. And it depends on how rare uh, the organism is. So um, for example, for we're doing a lot of studies of plant-associated microbiomes, and in leaf samples and stem samples in particular, if you run ribosomal RNA-PCR with the universal bacterial primers, you get 99% chloroplast back, because they're bacteria. Um, and we don't want to sequence the host chloroplast gene 200 billion times. Um, so we've started using primers that either avoid the cyanobacterial clade um, or, in fact, blocking agents. So there's a PNA blocking agent that can block um, anything in the cyanobacterial clade. So we miss the same lineage that the chloroplasts are from, but we get the rarer, the, the rarer organisms. And I can, I'd be happy to talk to you about how some of this works. Um, the bacterial people have a lot more experience with this because they've been doing these environmental PCR for 20 years. And, but the primers for ribosomal RNA are you know, nice because it's conserved at the DNA level, right? Not the, so I, it may take a little trick to get it to work for the mitochondrial genes. Um, we also do a lot of metagenomics, random shotgun sequencing from environmental communities. We need much more sequencing in those cases. We don't, we're not limited by uh, multiplexing. In the, I mean, in many systems, we'll do a whole MySeq run for one sample. Uh, because there we're interested in the genetic diversity, not just the taxonomic diversity. And so then if, you know, one bacterial genome has two to 3,000 genes, um, we actually don't even get good coverage of the moderately, you know, 2% abundance organisms we're missing in, in those cases. Does that answer? Um, but multiplexing is still sort of critical for many aspects. When you're doing PCR, you can add the multiplex tags onto your PCR primers, which does make it a little bit easier. Um, there are tricks that I'd be happy to talk to people about that people have developed for Illumina sequencing or for some of the other sequencing platforms for doing, uh, doing sequencing from very small amounts of DNA. Um, some of these tricks, which I'll get back to in a minute, involve amplifying your DNA from your sample with random amplification reactions, that's a little glitchy. Um, so um, there are kits that Illumina sells, for example, this Nextera kit, which many people use for making genomic DNA libraries. When you have very small amounts of sample, it's not completely random. So you make a library and you get out sequence data, but you don't randomly sample the original DNA from your sample. So if you want to build an assembly of an organism using this, uh, the coverage in different regions of the genome is not as uniform as you might want. There's also a lot of people using a whole slew of forms of what could be called capture methods, where you take your DNA from your organism of interest and you enrich the DNA for targeted taxa in a sample, say from a mixed sample with a host and a pathogen, or targeted genes from an organism of interest or, or whatever, any mixture of those. And there's a whole slew of approaches for doing this um, from, you know, uh, probably 10 different companies out there offer ways to try and do some type of capture. And then once you're done with the capture, you can treat the DNA in most cases, in essence, as you would for any other type of library construction. And then you now do sequencing of 
something enriched for one region of the genome or one set of genes or, again, one organism. Again, there are just an incredible array of these capture methods. But if you're interested in, you know, the population biology or evolution of some gene, um, and you want to get that from thousands of samples, uh, sequencing the whole genome from thousands of samples is annoying. Um, if the, the, the gene is PCRable, of course, you can PCR amplify that and use that as your capture method. But what people are using these capture methods for instead is sometimes if you want to get a thousand genes at once from an organism, not the whole genome, but, you know, a hundredth of the genome. Or if you want to get a bacteria from a mixed population, people are using this for, well, Bacchia endosymbionts, for example, of various uh, insects. Another really important thing for sequencing is the ability to um, sequence from the ends of your original piece of DNA. So if you just do single end sequencing with any one of these sequencing systems, you're basically just, you chop up the DNA from your organism of interest and then you read, say, 200 base pairs from one side of the DNA. And that gives you some data of your organism of interest, but it's not incredibly useful for, for example, building a genome assembly from that organism. And much more useful if you want to assemble back together pieces of the original genome is to use some method where you can take the DNA of interest, chop it up in some appropriate way, and then generate um, sequence from the left and right end of your original piece of DNA. And if you do that from a short piece of DNA, that at least gives you, so let's say you do it from a 500 base pair piece of DNA and you run 250 base pairs from the left end and 250 base pairs from the right end, now you get a 500 base pair piece, right, or millions of 500 base pair pieces from your organism of interest. But you can also do things like chop out the middle piece of a DNA and sequence the left end from base pair zero and the right end from base pair 10,000. And now, if you want to stitch back together the genome of that organism, you have a scaffold of the genome, 10,000 base pairs separated with each of your paired end sequences. So there's a lot of strategies that people have used for trying to generate sequence data that's from set distances apart in a targeted organism of interest for doing things like genome assembly or even uh, cDNA assembly in some cases. So I sort of hinted at this before, um, but I, I didn't go into the detail. So Roche sequencing, when people basically stopped using Roche sequencing, um, with the, the, the largest, um, best of the Roche systems, you could generate single sequence reads that were about 800 to 1,000 bases in length. And that um, size of sequencing has still not been achieved with Illumina sequencing. So the best that people are getting, as far as I know, is 300 base pair sequences. And if you do paired end sequencing, you can do basically 600 base pair pieces if you do paired ends from right next to each other. We haven't been incredibly successful at getting good data for past 250 base pairs. So we do 250 base pair paired end sequencing, and we can get a 500 base pair piece. That's not enough for doing certain types of genome assembly, for doing certain types of environmental sequencing, for doing certain types of uh, screening of mutants in organisms. Longer sequence reads can be beneficial for a variety of purposes. And that's why some people stuck with row sequencing for longer than they really wanted to, even though you were getting you know, errors in all of the single nucleotide runs and the emulsion PCR worked only about a third of the time, and you know there were other issues with it. Um, so what I'm going to tell you now is about an alternative method, um, which we've used a little bit in our lab, which is sort of a black box to us because they won't tell us exactly how it works, um, but it's pretty amazing in, in the end result. So this company called Moleculo created this. They then got bought by Illumina. Um, so if you have a good idea about, you know, cloning, just, you know, write a couple of papers on it and hope that Illumina buys your company. Um, so the way molecular works is really cool. You take DNA from your organism of interest. You get large fragments of the DNA. Let's say, 20, let's say each of these corresponds to 20,000 base pair pieces. So you have large fragments from your organism of interest. You isolate these fragments somehow. 
This is part of the black box. Let's just say maybe microfluidic devices, although we're not actually completely sure. Um, but you isolate the DNA. It could be in emulsion beads. It could be in you know, all, all sorts of different methods. And you make copies of it so that you have lots of copies in some physically isolated part of this original piece of DNA. And then you take that piece of this, you know, sample number one and sample number two and sample number three, separately you make an, a sub-library, an Illumina sequencing library with unique barcodes for this sample. So you add AAAA to all of the fragments from this sample and CCCCC to all the fragments from this sample and so on. So you use your multiplexing reagents and then you just run regular Illumina sequencing. You get back the sequence data. You flag it as to which piece it came from based upon the barcode. And now, instead of just mapping, saying this came from sample number one, because these came from larger DNA pieces, you can reassemble the large pieces running a little local genome assembly algorithm of all the blue DNA fragments or all the green DNA fragments and stitch back together these, what they call pseudo long reads from your targeted organism of interest. And it is, it's spectacular stuff. Um, uh, I don't know how, we got some free, we got a free sample of this basically from Moleculo. I have no idea what it costs now that Illumina bought it, um, but the data that we actually got back from Moleculo before they were bought, it's incredible. Um, so we got basically 10 to 20,000 base pair reads from a mixed population of microorganisms with, you know, in a couple of days, basically, um, and, you know, generated Illumina data that wasn't that expensive to generate, but it gave us these 20,000 base pair pseudo reads. So uh, that was, I think that was maybe two years ago. Yeah. When you first told the problem. I've got more detail about it in a, in a minute, if you can wait. Um, my grad student who was working on that um, got frustrated when Moleculo got bought by Illumina and they stopped helping us uh, interpret the data and wouldn't tell us even how the method worked. Um, so, you know, I, I'm Mr. Open Science. I really don't want to publish a paper where I can't say what was actually done with the data. So we decided, and I'll show you this in one minute, we decided that there was an alternative long read sequencing technology that we would like to compete against Moleculo. So we went to PacBio and said, hey, can you give us some free sequencing? Because we're about to write this paper on Moleculo, but we're kind of pissed off at them. Um, and they gave us tons of sequence data and it was even better than the Moleculo data. So we have a paper that we're basically, I'll show you the data from in a minute, but um, Moleculo just sort of disappeared on us and we didn't feel like we could publish it without a full description of the method, um, which was too bad, but it's still really cool. Um, is that sort of? Yeah, I, I just, I, like one of the most fascinating things seeing you do this talk every year is the perspective of, we think things go really quickly sometimes, yeah. and then sometimes they don't. Yeah, well, right, I mean, everything is, a, you, I mean, as I should have probably said, you know, um, even in the Sanger sequencing days, you know, I'm still writing papers from 12 years ago with genome data from 12 years ago, right? I mean, everything comes down to having people look at the data and do something with it. Um, and, you know, generating more data does not make that easier. Uh, it sometimes gives you better answers, but you still have to have people actually write things up. And in this case, it just became impossible to to publish something. But let me get to her, her data on PacBio because it's even cooler um, than this. So an alternative method that's really useful, and I won't go into a lot of detail on this, is what's called Hi-C. It's basically um, developed for studying chromatin structure in eukaryotes. And you can take a DNA sample um, from a cell and cross-link the DNA inside the cell. And if you have DNA that's wrapped around histones, and physically close to another piece of DNA that is far apart in the genome, but physically close in the cell. You can cross-link those pieces together, and then with the various tricks for making a DNA sequencing library, you can tell that those two pieces were in the same region of the cell. And people have used this a lot for chromatin regulation and chromatin um, sort of transcriptional regulation dynamics in eukaryotes. 
but it's also a useful tool for genome assembly. So there have been a couple of papers recently where people have used the same general strategy to get um, paired end sequences, basically, that are a million base pairs apart in a chromosome. And now you have a scaffold that is basically the size of a chromosome from this high C sequence data. And a few people have written papers showing that this is an incredibly good way for generating haplotype assemblies within eukaryotic genomes. We've used this a little bit for metagenomic sequencing from environmental samples. You can also do this same thing. And instead of detecting you know, how close DNA is within a cell, it allows us to cross-link together DNA from the same organism in a mixed community. And then when we sequence it, it's basically a way of sorting DNA so that we know two pieces of DNA come from the same organism in a mixed community. And again, we don't need long reads to do this. We just need this high C cross-linking um, to do it. A grad student of mine, Chris Patel, published a paper on this last year, and we're continuing to try and develop this. There's a, a similar method um, from this uh, company, Dovetail. Uh, they call it the Chicago method. I'm not sure exactly what the abbreviation stands for, but it's basically a similar concept uh, to doing this high C cross-linking. Another thing that's grown a lot in the last couple of years has been single cell sequencing. Most of these approaches to single cell sequencing involve taking um, cells from a sample, sorting them in some way, like with a fax uh, fluorescently activated cell sorter, or some other approach to sorting them such that you end up with a single cell inside a microtiter dish, or a single cell inside an emulsion bead, or something to that effect. You then lyse the cell, and you run a reaction that randomly copies the genomic DNA in that cell. What most people are using is something called MDA, multiple displacement amplification. Um, it's a rolling circle polymerase from a bacteria virus. And you make um, lots of copies of the genome from that single cell. And then you can use those copies for Illumina sequencing or whatever other sequencing reaction that you want. The MDA amplification is not even remotely random. So when people do this, you sometimes end up with 90% of the genome of interest and sometimes 10% of the genome of interest. But if you work like we do with organisms that can't be cultured in the lab, that are rare from an environmental sample, we can do flow sorting of cells from a sample. We can then run ribosomal RNA-PCR on each of the different sorted cells from the sample, identify which well contains a cell corresponding to a rare organism from that sample, and then sequence its whole genome. And so this um, MDA amplification, even if we only get 50% of the genome from that single cell, it's a heck of a lot more about some of these lineages than we've ever had before. So that's what we're using for this um, filling in the branches in the Tree of Life project that we're doing with the Joint Genome Institute. And then the the last, um, the last part of DNA sequencing that I want to talk about, and again, this is not, so this is not a time tree of life here. Um, this is not ordered by any particular time series, so some of these came out a lot earlier than they will show up as branching patterns on this tree. Um, and there's, you know, reticulation in here I'm not showing to, um, and downright copying, um, <laughs> stealing, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the fourth generation of sequencing is what I would call single, single molecule sequencing. And um, there are multiple approaches that have been developed for doing this. Some of them are pretty old. Some of them are pretty new. Some of them have been claimed to work for many years and only recently showed up as actually working. Um, so there was a company called Helicos, which I don't think is uh, really developing their single molecule sequencer much anymore, but they may still be in existence. Pacific Biosciences, which I'll tell you a tiny bit about in a minute, and Oxford nanopores, which I will tell you about um, in a minute. Um, I'm not even going to go into the details on Helicos because people don't really use it anymore, but PacBio is getting actually a growing niche share of the market for DNA sequencing. And the way PacBio sequencing works is pretty amazing. Um, you basically uh, take a DNA polymerase, you affix that DNA polymerase onto a uh, a slide where there's a little hole for the DNA polymerase. And then you attach the template DNA to that single DNA polymerase. And you have um, uh, 
very fancy, basically confocal microscope that's going to watch in real time as that single DNA polymerase copies the single template that is attached to it. So it watches basically a normal DNA replication reaction happening in this, on this slide. And that's important because most of the other sequencing systems work via cycles of chemical reactions where you're adding some chemical, washing something off, detecting some signal, washing something off, adding some chemical, washing something off. So for example, Illumina sequencing, each cycle takes, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours per base pair. This is 15 base pairs per second. So it's watching in real time as a DNA polymerase copies a template molecule. And they have um, basically fluorescent labels that they add to the nucleotide precursors to allow this to happen. They have all sorts of fancy um, physics behind how they designed this system to work. Um, but the, the end picture is that somewhat inaccurately, but accurate enough to be useful for many purposes, they can watch as a DNA polymerase copies a template piece of DNA. And that copying can be very, what's called processive. Um, they can see 100,000 base pair reads um, when doing this. The main problem with that is if they run the, the microscope that whole time, they will burn out some of the enzymes. So what they tend to do is watch, you know, you can watch a thousand base pairs and then let it sit for a while running the reaction but without the light on basically and then watch the second, you know, the 3,000 base pairs to 4,000 and let it sit for a while. Um, but you can get incredibly long sequencing reads with this system. Yeah. Um, there, there's, a, there's a high um, SNP error rate at least. Um, I'm not sure how high the indel error rate actually is. I, I don't know. Um, uh, but at least a year and a half ago, the accuracy of just even reading the single base correctly was pretty bad. But I, I, I don't know the actual indel um, error rate. We're not, so I'll show you what we're using it for, which is nothing to do directly with this um, in particular. So what, um, I'm just going to skip over these slides. You get long reads, and you can use them for assemblies. But one of the most interesting things about PacBio is that because it's watching in polymerase time, it's not in you know, chemical cycle time, if there's something wrong or altered about the template DNA, that changes the kinetics of how this copying reaction happens. And so for example, if the template DNA is methylated, it changes the timing of how the new nucleotide comes in and then the growing chain gets elongated. Changes it just a little bit, but statistically enough that if you're looking at a genome and you want to figure out which regions of the genome are methylated and you're sequencing many different pieces of that same genome, you can sum up across those many pieces and detect that there's at you know, position 35, there's a hiccup. Something wrong happened at that cytosine compared to all the other cytosines in the genome. And by doing this for a while, they have figured out what that signature is for a variety of chemical modifications to DNA, especially methylation. So there are a large number of people now using PAC biosequencing for um, looking at the epigenome in eukaryotes, for example, for detecting methylation patterns within a eukaryotic genome. And it is, so we have a PAC biosequencer at UC Davis. Um, uh, I think it's used about 90% of the time for people to do epigenetics. And it's just, the, the, you know, again, it's, you can't tell in a single run of a piece of DNA perfectly, but if you are, re, you know, sequencing a region of the genome over and over and over again from a cancer cell, um, you can statistically show that that region of the genome is methylated compared to another region of the genome. And even which base is methylated within that region of the genome. So this comes back to your <laughs> question now. So the molecular sequencing, what we were actually using it for was I had a grad student, Lizzie Wilbanks, who's now a postdoc in, at Caltech, 
who was studying this um, very unusual, um, what called pink berries. It's a photosynthetic microbial consortia that's been a model system for this Woods Hole microbial diversity course for the last 20 or so years. You go out to marshes at low tide and um, right around Woods Hole, these marshes are filled with these little pink berries. People didn't really understand exactly what they were, but it's basically carbohydrate goo with a collection of anywhere from six to 10 microbial taxa in the system. And even though there are only about six to 10 dominant microbial taxa, there are also some rare taxa in these systems, regular sequencing, so we did a variety of shotgun sequencing and attempts at metagenomic assembly from these pink berry consortiums um, and were unable to get good assemblies of most of the microbes from, from these systems, no matter what we did with regular Illumina sequencing, with 454 sequencing, with um, Sanger sequencing um, from these systems. So when Molecular came along two years ago or two and a half years ago and said, hey, you know, our, we know you do metagenomics. Do you have any interesting samples we can play with? We gave them some of these samples. And um, that's where they generated these incredible 10,000 base pair reads to 20,000 base pair reads from this community of microorganisms. And we were starting to get good assemblies from the organisms from these samples. And then again, sort of Moleculo disappeared on us, so we went to PacBio and said, hey, can you also do this for us? And what, um, this is a slide that Lizzie gave me, what she basically did was compared, so um, with Moleculo, she took these pink berries and generated these two to 20,000 base pair synthetic long reads. We also generated random shotgun sequence data with HiSeq, and we also generated this PacBio data um, with single base pair, single um, DNA piece reads. And in particular with the PAC bio data, we were able to assemble back together complete genomes for many members of this um, community. The molecular data was pretty good too, but again, it's a bit of a black box, so we weren't um, completely trusting of it. But what was most interesting was um, one of the researchers at PAC bio, Meredith Ashby, said, you know, we want to try this thing. Everybody in the eukaryotic world is using the methylation detection to detect um, epigenetic tags on the DNA. What if we went back to this sample, and you can't tell, but there are you know, six to 10 different major taxa in the sample. And what we're, the problem that we're having is we, we shred the DNA, we shotgun sequence, and then we try and stitch back together the genomes from this mixed community of organisms. And even with 10,000 base pair reads, we can't figure out in every case which piece goes with which organism. Sometimes there are regions that don't get sequenced. Sometimes there are repeat sequences that are um, between strains. So the ribosome RNA sequences are identical between close relatives. If you have two different strains of the same species in a sample, you'll never be able to tease them apart if you don't have really long sequence reads. So we were having trouble with doing this. And what Meredith suggested doing and what ended up working out incredibly well was she said, well, maybe if we add on top of this information the methylation information, maybe we can tell, maybe different strains of the same species have different methylation patterns. And maybe um, the regions that aren't assembling well because we just didn't get good coverage from one of these or other organisms will have a signature methylation pattern in it. And it turns out that they did. So they scanned through the data, found motifs in large DNA pieces that appeared to be signature motifs of particular organisms' methylation patterns, grouped all of the fragments that had methylation at CTACKAC, and pooled those together into one bin, and then assembled those. And that's what helped finish assembling the genomes of many of these organisms. So by combining together long sequence reads with this other data that you can only get from PAC bio data, which is methylation data, we were able to stitch back together the genomes from these samples. Oh, and um, Rich Roberts at New England Biolabs, who is um, obsessed with scanning through genomes now from PAC biodata to find these methylation patterns. Um, they, of course, sell you know, restriction enzymes. They're really interested in finding new restriction enzymes. He helped us a lot with the matching of methylation patterns to putative restriction enzymes and methylases encoded in the fragments of the genomes of these organisms. So to make a long story short, 
with the PAC bio data in particular, we were finally able to assemble back together genomes from these organisms. And just for example, um, I'll tell you the story in one second. So the, the big problem that we have with metagenomic sequencing is a lot of people think we can go to an environmental sample, grind it up, shotgun sequence that sample, and then with the fragmented reads, not even assembling the genomes, just with the fragmented reads, predict the function of the ecosystem from annotating the functions encoded in all the individual reads, even if you don't know which functions <coughs> go together in which organism, even if you don't know what pathways are complete, even if you don't, so, so there's a lot of work in metagenomics where people are just trying to sort of annotate all of the functions in a community without trying to map those functions to individual organisms or cells or two functions to the same cell. And by having complete genomes of these organisms, Lizzie was actually able to find an incredibly novel property, which is one of these organisms that's a sulfur, it doesn't, I'm sure people don't care that much about this, but anyway, there's a mixture of functions that we didn't expect to find together in these organisms for this um, relatively unusual light-mediated proton pump called proteorhodopsin, and she sent uh, the sequence to uh, someone who studies these genes they actually synthesized it in vitro and showed that this is um, some type of light-mediated sulfate reduction coupling system, which is the first one that's been found. And so we never would have done this without having contigs, large assembled contigs from this organism. This gene was in our data, in the random shotgun sequence data. We completely ignored it. We had no idea which organism it went with. We didn't know that it was in a sulfate reducer. We didn't know that it was in an organism that was you know, photo autotrophic, and we just, we couldn't make sense out of things until having these big assemblies. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is something I've been dissing for years, um, and I guess no longer. Um, so Oxford nanopores is the other of these single molecule sequencing systems. They've been talking about their system for a long, long time. It's incredibly cool in concept. They basically take a protein um, membrane pore, so a protein that sits in a membrane and forms a pore that you can transport things through the middle of the pore, and they've converted this into a DNA sensor. So if you pull DNA through this pore, um, you can, by detecting some changes in the um, structure of the pore, basically, or the chemistry of the pore, you can tell what base of DNA is being pulled through that pore. And they've been working on this for a very, very long time to try and figure out ways to convert a pore and to design a new pore into a DNA sequencing system. Um, I won't go into all the details on the chemistry, but just get to the shiny, happy thing that I've been making fun of for the last few years, um, which is their thumb drive sequencer that you, know, you can plug into your computer USB port and there's a little hole in it that you drop your DNA into and magically, um, you get DNA sequence data fed into your computer via this nanopore system. And it just, it seemed ridiculous. I mean, let's, I mean, I'll just be clear and um, in full disclosure, I'm not exactly a huge fan of the company. For example, I wrote in my blog a few days ago about their conference that had only male speakers um, that they invited to celebrate their sequencing system. Um, so I'm, I'm as big a skeptic as could possibly be of their technology, of their ridiculous marketing, and of you know, some of the personalities at their company. And yet, um, in the last couple of months, it's very clear that people are in fact getting usable genome sequence data out of these thumb drive sequencers. It's unreal. Um, so this guy, Nick Lohman, who's been one of the people testing, got one of the first test versions, I mean, this is the DNA sequencer right there next to a laptop. Um, he's been testing them, building an array of them, connecting together, uh, you know, a couple of them to multiple computers. This is basically the library construction protocol, something like, you know, 90 to 100 minutes to prepare the DNA to feed into the sequencer. And then you run the sequencing and in, you know, 180 minutes you get uh, 1.5 times 10 to the seventh base pairs of sequence data coming back out. It's not the highest quality sequence data in the history of the planet, um, but it's good enough that you can do things with it, especially if you have a reference genome that you want to compare it to.
There are now multiple papers that have been published on using this Minion, is what it's called, um, the Minion uh, portable nanopore sequencer um, to generate reference bacterial genomes. They have a couple different you know, discussions of how to do the assemblies. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, single molecule DNA sequencing by pulling the DNA through uh, protein pore in a tiny little device that you can plug into your computer. And in theory, other than one step in this process, which apparently requires some serious centrifugation um, that people are working on adaptations to, this is very potentially going to be usable, you know, out on a canoe in the middle of the, the bay here or in any other field site um, to do serious DNA sequencing in a, you know, a remote site without having to do much library construction or anything particularly messy if they can figure out a couple of steps that are currently complicated. So I, I have been, I've been mocking them everywhere I go for five years now probably because they, they announced that they had a machine, they had a competition for people to win machines they took ideas from everybody in the community and then said, we don't, we're not ready to give you a machine. So, I mean, it was just crazy, but it really does seem to work. And they're about, I think, $500 for one of these or something like that right now. They're selling big versions of it, but um, I want them. Um, we, they tested a few in the Genome Center here, but I want a stack of them. I want hundreds of them. I want to do sequencing in remote field sites. We have people in my lab who are doing work in Antarctica. We have people who are doing work in Namibia. We have people doing work in places where we would love to get some sequence data in the field. And this is the first thing I've seen that might get that. So, um, so is it not, I mean, why is it not just going to replace Luna a year Right, okay, so that's a great question. First of all, it's expensive per read. So it's useful for easy sequencing in resource-limited environments. It's useful for rapid sequencing. For example, what Nick Lohman is trying to use it for is sequencing microbes diagnostically that are infecting someone in the clinic. So if you can turn around that DNA in 90 minutes and get sequence in three hours, that is really potentially useful for a sepsis infection, for example to say what antibiotic might you want to use for that infection. And Illumina sequencing is just not quick enough right now for those uses. So I think what they're thinking about is things that could be used very rapidly in some type of clinical diagnostics. But why wouldn't you just do it for everything? Because of the quality? The quality is low and the cost is high. So what's the cost? You said it was 500 $500 for one chip, which is generating, you know, 100 million sequence, bases of sequence, right? A, a MySeq run, we, we do a MySeq run, we get 25 million sequences, pared down sequences, it's $1,200. I didn't realize they were disposable. Oh, yeah, it's one run. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, I thought they were. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, for, for, Graduate students who are in Antarctica doing samples of a microbial mat, I'll pay $25,000. I mean, I will. Like that, it costs them more per day to rent the hut than it does to, to do this. So um, there's a balance, right? So, um, and again, in the clinic for the turnaround time for someone with an infection, MRSA or something that the antibiotics aren't responding to, you'll pay. I mean, there are already, so for people, I have a collaboration with someone at the UC Davis Hospital who's studying sepsis infections. And I kind of scarily did uh, grand rounds with him in the hospital. Um, in the intensive care unit in the hospital, like half of the patients have antibiotic resistant infections. Many of them are there for months. Um, they're probably costing, you know, it's probably $500,000 for some of them in terms of their care. Of course you would sequence the genome of whatever is infecting them. I mean, it just, and you want to do it quickly because if you give them the wrong antibiotic, that's why they crash and go into severe sepsis. Basically. So, so, can this, so like, let's say you go into a country that doesn't allow you to export from it. Ah, that's the other place where we're thinking of using them. Um, 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. Can you get into legal trouble for exporting DNA sequence data instead of the DNA? Yeah, of course. So there are biopiracy laws that deal with data, not just with organisms. Um, uh, some of them, you know, are loose and some of them are, are strict. Uh, but, but in most cases, you should probably discuss, you know, exporting data at the same time as exporting samples. There are many regulations that relate to pathogens or um, invasive species that they don't want you to import, but they don't mind the data. So in those cases, it, this would be a great thing um, because you know, we can't bring soil back from anywhere, basically, because of the potential t organisms in it. Um, so, I mean, I, regardless of what's happening in the technology, I mean, I think you can expect that at least Illumina sequencing will continue to dominate for a few years. The reason that many people wouldn't use this a lot is that the other thing that Illumina is great for is counting. So because you get hundreds of millions of sequence reads, you can use Illumina sequencing to count RNA for doing you know, gene transcription profiles. We use it for counting taxa in samples, people are using it to count relative abundance of cancer cells versus non-cancer cells. I just came back from this meeting that they're doing um, a lot of Illumina sequencing for prenatal diagnostics, and you count the relative abundance of different alleles to identify which ones correspond to the infant, the, the fetus, as opposed to, to the mother. And so there, it doesn't matter per se how accurate it is, it matters that you're getting hundreds of millions of sequence reads. Um, and it doesn't matter really what the turnaround time is compared to, to this. So I think the counting approaches, Illumina slaughters everyone else in right now. But I think some of these single molecule sequencing methods or the pseudo single molecule sequencing methods like Moleculo, they're gonna get more and more prominent because getting big fragments of DNA is useful for haplotype reconstruction, is useful for population genetics. Of anything, it's useful for these environmental studies. It's useful for assembling genomes. Um, and that, Illumina doesn't do well right now. So, anyway. I, I just have one other comment. The perspective I've gained from seeing the product over the last number of years is that uh, I think a lot of times we hear about something at a meeting from a friend and colleague, yeah. CNN or whatever, great new sequencing technology I think a lot of people are inclined when they see that, they're like, well, I'm, I, why sequence with Illumina now? Because it's going to be obsolete in six months. Yeah. But it's from what we see, like, pack, the first time I heard about PacBio was like eight years ago, right? Yeah. We heard about Lantorn five years ago. So, like, the turnaround from, like, we hear about it, amazing new technology, to those of us in this room using it, you, mean, you think it's fair to say, like, the average five to ten years with most of these technologies? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, iPhones and yeah. things like that. I mean, I think the key thing to remember is Illumina is dominating not just because they're useful. They're dominating because they're dominant. And they have suites of associated informatics tools and suites of people that have expertise and companies that are selling library construction kits. And everything is now optimized for Illumina sequencing. So if PAC bio sequencing comes along and finally gets high enough quality, we don't even have a kit to make a library to feed into PAC bio sequencing. So we, we have a PAC bio machine and we went to PAC bio to get some sequence because it was a lot easier. So, so I think a lot of it is that momentum, a lot of it is molecular biology is voodoo. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, just cookbook recipe after recipe after recipe until you get to the point where you're good at doing something, we're really good at feeding Illumina sequencing right now. And for God's sake, I don't want, I don't want that to change. <laughs> I don't want to try out Ion Torrent or any of these other systems. And I think that that's true in a lot of places. And if you add on top of that the informatics, so like Nick Lohman um, posted this paper on doing the genome, you know, reference genome assembly with the Minion, 
And then this uh, other genome assembly with the Minion, and he posted a paper on tools for doing Minion sequence analysis. Most other people couldn't figure out how the hell to do any of this, even once he posted those things. So it wasn't trivial to even get data from the machine into an assembler. And I think that that's one of the different, one of the things we don't really realize is when a company comes out, I mean, this is why I was always critical of Oxford Nanopores. They presented four years ago at a conference that they assembled an E. coli genome. They never released the data. I assume because no one would have been able to figure out how to deal with the weird data that came out of it. So I think a company that works on something full time and their beta testers who are stockholders sometimes and scientific advisory board members and have been working with them for 15 years, they make it seem really easy when it comes out that first time. And, and our experience has been it's n not a single one of these systems has been 